we went over you know what you do at your lab what experiments you know you're setting up what you're trying to achieve on a high level a lot of people are really interested in the quantum space in general a lot of them might be like me they're fascinated by the term but they don't really know what it means something which comes up a lot in tech is you know quantum computing can you kind of explain what they're trying to achieve in that space why is quantum computing such a hot topic yeah so so i would say most of the physics that i just talked with you about I guess in the other video, what we would call quantum simulation. And the motivations in this space, if you will, are mostly kind of fundamental physics angled. So we have questions that we want to answer about statistical mechanics, kind of like this, this gap between the quantum world and the world around us. Like this is, the motivations here are mostly like, if you want to say academic in nature. The other angle that people take a lot of the time when they talk about uh, quantum research is, as you said, quantum computing, and the angle there is more information theoretic or even computer science when people talk about it. And the, the basic idea of the quantum computer is you're replacing the classical bit which you find in a computer, and what that is is basically a transistor which can be on or off, which yeah. is zero or one, right, in the language of binary. You're replacing that with what's called a quantum bit or okay. a qubit in the parlance yeah. of the field. And the idea there is you replace the transistor with a quantum system, which can be in two states. So okay. we call this a two-level quantum system. And instead of being at any given time either zero or either one, the magic here is you can be in a superposition, as we say of both of those. So in other words, these quantum bits, they're not zero, they're not one until you measure them to be either zero or one. Okay. And until that point, they're in this kind of like fuzzy, probabilistic superposition state. And the other interesting thing you can get with these quantum bits is that you can correlate them in a way that's called entangling the quantum okay. bits. And the idea there is if I do some operation on one quantum bit that's entangled to another, then what I do over here has a physical effect on what happens over here. And so you can use this to build up like massive correlations across your system which couldn't exist in the in the classical computing and paradigm. how is that helpful like why is let's say you know now IBM so excited about it and why is you know the, the Google so excited about it right so I, I think the the term that people throw around a lot of the time is exponential speed up the idea I guess is to specify the state of a classical bit register you need to tell me n numbers for n numbers of bits. You need to tell me bit 1 is 0, 2 is 1, 3 yeah. is 0, and so on. To specify the state of a quantum equivalent of that, so n qubits, you need to tell me 2 to the n numbers because okay. you need to specify the probabilities that the system could be in you know, any number of states, right? Because okay. of the superposition property that I, okay. I mentioned before. And so the, the game of quantum computing is really to like harness this maybe exponential size of the system to do computing exponentially faster, right? Yeah. It's a bit more complicated than that, right? Yeah. Because it turns out to be rather a, ra a rather subtle question, like exactly how you can design the system to like harness that speed up. Because at the end of the day, you will measure the system, you will get like a string of zeros and ones, but the game is how can I design it in such a way that that final measurement tells me more than what the classical computer could have told me. Okay. I guess like in terms of quantum research, you know, you have work being done at these companies and you have work, right. you know, do being done in academia. Right. Are you trying to achieve something fundamentally different? Yeah, so one thing I guess we've we've maybe glossed over a bit is the question of how does one build such a system? Yeah. What exactly would this qubit consist of? And that is like that's a very interesting question that physicists would be interested in as well. Right? Like, what are the best qubit systems, so to speak? Mm. And so one very active form of especially academic research would be like testing out different platforms that could potentially be used for quantum computing. And, and from our point of view, we're, we're concerned with kind of building up a system of maybe like 10, 20, at most maybe like some hundreds of, of quantum bits from a given platform that we think is promising. But an academic is not as interested in making that a proprietary thing. In other words, like scaling that up to a system of thousands of, or tens of thousands of quantum bits, deploying it in like a, a consumer friendly way. Yeah. Right? Where th this is something that's in a way more of an engineering problem. Mm. Um, it's something that will need to happen before 
quantum computing actually like takes off on, yeah, on a mass level. Right, yeah. the application kind of side of things. We're not as interested like that scaling process itself. Of course, we're interested when we, when we propose a new system, of course, we'll want to say this system has good prospects. Of being scaled. For being yeah. scaled, right? So to give a concrete example, there are many companies like Amazon, IBM, Google, there's a lot of startups which spin off of, you know, acad academia groups, right? They use a whole slew of systems. So the one that our lab focuses on is cold atoms. So we take single atoms, we trap them into kind of, you know, system of laser beams. We can control the interactions between them. That's one way of doing it. Yeah. And in that case, the qubit would be like a ground state and some excited state of the atom. Yeah. Another thing people do are, are they trap ions, right? That's, okay. that's another system. Yeah, there, there's basically a whole variety of there's ways. dozens yeah. if not hundreds already of proposals for this stuff so like since you know it seems that you know you're trying to understand how to build up a system and then you know companies like ibm are kind of thinking of you know how do we scale it how do we apply it you know it's it's natural that you know when there is a return of investment tied to it there's more incentive to put money into it and you mm -hmm. mentioned you know a lab like this one you know receives for a year anywhere from a range from like $1 million to $10 million in funding. You know, where is that money coming from? Why are they giving it to you? And, you know, and what type of return on investment are you promising? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I would say, you know, in the, in the realm of academia, I don't know if people use the language of investments as much. You know, yeah. it's, it's, of course, like the funding is structured into grants. Right? Yeah. So typically what you'll do is you'll apply a lot of the times to a government agency. For example, the, the National Science Foundation, NSF. You'll say, hey, like we have a proposal to build such and such a system, do such and such an experiment. The NSF would or some other funding agency would judge the merit of that proposal. And they'll say, OK, we'll give you half a million dollars over five years to build the system. At the end of that time, you'll submit some documents to us that will show us you know, exactly what you've accomplished. It's possible you'll get an extension of that grant if we're pleased with the progress. So that's kind of like one common funding stream. A lot of the time, universities or academics will kind of band together and mm. submit collective applications. So in the case of Harvard and MIT, we have what's called the Center for Ultra Cold Atoms. And in that case, we have a consortium of maybe a dozen groups who collectively apply for grants. Mm. These ones will be much larger. They'll be to the tune of 10 to $20 million dispersed over, say, six years. And then it will be decided like internally how that money is partitioned. And at the end of the day, I would say like a, a lab will apply for many grants from many different agencies with a budget of some millions per year. On these that makes sense. And yeah. how much of that is, you know, going into salaries and how much of that is going into equipment? And yeah, so, so I would say a lot of the grant money is going to equipment, probably more than the salaries. Like my yearly salary after taxes is like 36K, for instance, like a, a postdoc will make maybe like 40 or 50K. We have like 10 to 15 people in our lab. But to give you another example, like a single laser could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, yeah. which is worth, if you want to think of it that way, Two, many three. grad students, yeah. right? So it's like... <laughs> One laser yeah. versus three grad students. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is the kind of calculus a lab sometimes has to do, right? Like personnel yeah. versus equipment. And I think a lot of the grant money goes to equipment, though. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, this field has a lot of opportunities. You know, a lot of money is being poured in. A lot of talent is going in. What are the prospects? What are some big things you could see in the future uh, because of you know what we discover in this field so so in terms of prospects i would i would maybe divide the answer into two parts one would be more theoretical or on the principal side and one would be on the implementation side so first to address the principles i think there it is still very much like an open theoretical question exactly like what is the a set of questions for which quantum computers can be expected to give us some kind of like substantial speed up over classical counterparts. And there's this question of quantum supremacy, for example, is, is a, a term you'll hear, hear batted around. And what that refers to is this kind of quest to identify a problem and actually, you know, solve the problem on a quantum computer and prove that no classical supercomputer counterpart could have done it faster. Right? Okay. So you want to say, like, we needed a quantum computer to do this. Okay. There are already theoretical proposals for certain classes of problems which this would be applicable to. I think maybe the most interesting for the government, for instance, would be the factorization of prime numbers. Because it turns out a lot of 
passwords, a lot of encryptions are basically, they, they depend on the fact that if you gave me a large arbitrary number, it's very hard for me to tell you what are the prime factors of that number. In, in other words, if you wanted to come up with a methodical algorithmic way of doing that, it's very difficult. It was shown in the 90s by Peter Shore that you can actually do that exponentially faster with a quantum computer. Mm -hmm. And what that means is like the scaling with, for example, the number of digits is much, much more favorable in the quantum case than it is for the best shown classical case. It's essentially the promise of quantum computing, the speed. The speed is, is what one hopes for. Like in, okay. in this like information kind of focused paradigm, I would say. Okay. So the, the factorization of prime numbers is probably like the question like most people will talk about, but still there could be others. It's still very much an open question. There was, I think there have been experiments that like factor the number 15 into the prime factors five and three, <laughs> showing that like it can be done, but like to, to do it in a way that would actually be like uh, useful to the US government, for instance, you need probably thousands of qubits mm -hmm. and that's where the practical side comes into play. Right, so then we start to talk about how does one build a quantum computer? What is the platform? What are the prospects for scaling it up? And this is more of a controversial question. I don't think there's yet um, a creme de la creme, yeah. so to speak, of, of quantum computing platforms of qubits. There are a number of promising proposals, yeah. but there are certain like very hard things. Like I, I can rattle off a whole list of things that one needs to think about when building a quantum computer. You need a super high degree of control. You need to be able to measure a quantum mechanical system. You need to be able to initialize that system into like a precisely known state. You need to be able to keep it quantum, so yeah. to speak. You need to like establish that control and keep control for long enough to do a computation. And um, I mean, for instance, like people are even worried that like a fundamental limitation of quantumness of a system could be like cosmic rays that are constantly passing through us and, and interfering with, with the physics mm -hmm. that's happening at the atomic level. Yeah. Right? So, so this is another very challenging problem that we're gonna have to spend. I would say probably it's gonna take us at least a decade to hash these things out in a way that everyone agrees on. People have certainly achieved and shown that there are, there are useful problems mm -hmm. that have this quantum speed up. There are papers from the last couple of years, which I'm not prepared to go into the details of, but yeah. like, which are showing on like graph theory problems that you get this quantum speed up. And then like, okay, like you can map them onto like more useful problems, like yeah. the US government trying to hack a password <laughs> somewhere. It's, it's complicated. It's yeah, complicated and it's not quite there, but I think we're at a spot where we can see a clear path that we need to take. Mm -hmm and we're starting to have a better sense of what that payoff will be. So for those watching, you know, we had Ryan for a lab tour where he generously showed and talked about what he achieves, what the lab does on a high level and the equipment and system and the settings that go behind it. This was more, uh, you know, for those interested about the bigger questions of Antoine, a more interview. If you're just here for educational entertainment, you could check out the lab tour. And you know, if you're just here to know more about quantum computing, the, you know, the prospects, the future, the work that is being done here, this interview is for you.